Hello and welcome to this podcast from the BBC World Service. Please let us know what you think and tell other people about us on social media. Podcasts from the BBC World Service are supported by advertising. We all have goals, especially career goals, like enhancing and diversifying our skills or tapping into a broader network of opportunity. The Cornell Executive MBA is designed for goal achievers from any industry by advancing your career without any interruption, by providing global perspectives and intimate classroom settings, by challenging, informing, connecting, and propelling you. Achieve your goals with the Cornell Executive MBA on the weekend and close to home. Search My Cornell EMBA to start your journey. Welcome to Science in Action from the BBC World Service with me, Roland Pease. And today we have a little earthquake engineering. You can potentially build up the pressures less and keep yourself from tipping the fault over that critical reduction in strength by driving smaller events that are more frequent, but are therefore less distressing and less damaging. A new way of detecting early stage dementia. So you're going to see these images now flash up very rapidly. And embedded in this stream are going to be the images that you just learned. They are very fast. Yep. And we hear about prospects for a new antiviral against COVID-19. With the second anniversary of the first known cases of COVID-19 on the horizon, it's frustrating how little we still know about the origins of the disease, how a bat virus first started spreading in one of China's largest cities. One virus, labelled RATG13, found long ago in a Yunnan mine, is 96.1% similar to SARS-CoV-2. But that means their last common ancestor was circulating probably 50 years ago. Other relatives have been dug out from researchers' frozen collections. But there's been a lot of interest this week in new sampling by a team of experts from France and Laos that has found a coronavirus that is remarkably similar to SARS-CoV-2 at the receptor binding domain, RBD, on the spike protein. That's the portion that attaches to our ACE2 receptors before infecting human cells. Marc Eloir of the Institut Pasteur directed the quest which brought samples back from cast caves near the border with China. Our colleagues from Laos have sampled more than 600 bats. They have taken blood samples and faces also. And uh, we have tried to find, uh, to de- first to describe the, the virome of this uh, material and we have focused indeed on the Sarbeco viruses. The ones which are related to the SARS virus. Exactly. And when you get these samples, what you're, you're fishing out, as far as I understand it, you're fishing out genetic material from these VC samples and also looking for live viruses, is that right? For both. We have begun with uh, genetic material. And once we have found interesting genetic material, meaning viruses close to SARS-CoV-2, we have tried to isolate, meaning cultivate the virus in in cells. And we have been successful for one of these viruses. And what's interesting, I think, about your paper is focusing very much on the spike protein, which is this part of the virus that gets into our cells. You've been looking to see how similar the spike proteins on these bat coronaviruses are to the SARS-CoV-2 that's circulating amongst in the pandemic. Yes, indeed, the first thing we have looked in the seconds was uh, not only the spike, but more precisely what we name the RBD, standing for receptor binding domain, which is exactly the, the few stretch of amino acids that bind to the cellular receptor, which is named ACE2. So this is the sort of lock and key mechanism that helps them do that, that very precise part. Exactly, exactly. And in fact, there are 17 amino acids that interact between SARS-CoV-2 and human ACE2. And in our viruses, we have found that 16 or 15, depending on the viruses, work the same. Although the most closely matched samples had this remarkably similar receptor binding domain, none had another crucial component that seems to be key to the way SARS-CoV-2 infects our cells, a small section that reacts with a second human enzyme furin. That 
would have to have been picked up some way during SARS-CoV-2's evolution. And what Mark Eloir's team did note was a strong tendency for different strains of bat coronavirus to shuffle their parts around, a kind of molecular mix and match that biologists call recombination. Coronaviruses in general are very prone to recombination. So SARS-CoV-2 is clearly the result of recombination with part of the genomes coming from different bad viruses. And each bad virus itself is a result of recombination between different uh, ancestor bad viruses. And the most important part of the paper is to demonstrate that in this mosaic, all part of the mosaic, we we have identified uh, 15 uh, fragments that could come from different ancestor viruses. But all these ancestor viruses have been demonstrated to exist in bats. It it seems to me that your paper is saying that this idea of a natural origin is more plausible. You've got more evidence that this kind of thing is happening. What do you think the prospects are of finding the ancestral virus to SARS-CoV-2 in a cave of the sort that you're looking at? So if you mean a virus with 100% identity with SARS-CoV-2, I would say that it's like finding a a needle in a... How do you say? um, Haystack. Exactly, exactly. But with the viruses we have found, we are very close to SARS-CoV-2, in fact, because 96.8% identity plus uh, the fact that the main sites that determine the Ostropism uh, that corresponds to something which is very close to the ancestor. The other remaining question is if this kind of virus is circulating in bats in this part of Indochina, what's the route then, in your opinion, into the wet markets of Wuhan? This is a missing link. If we add any information regarding antibody testing before the emergence of the virus in one, it would be easier to interpret the emergence of the virus. Uh, generally speaking, when a virus emerged, have a look to HIV, for example. It had been demonstrated that the virus began to circulate in human populations something like 15 years before the first case were identified. And, uh, and for many epidemics, people look back to a bank of sera, which are kept, if, for example, in uh, bl- blood banks or in hospitals, uh, to try to, to find evidence of antibodies uh, well before the emergence of the virus. And uh, we lack this type of, of information. So if you consider the hypothesis that this kind of virus with low pathogenicity could have circulated in human population before the emergence. This would be an, another story than considering that a fully virulent virus was present somewhere in this landscape and has jumped into Wuhan. So how COVID arrived in Wuhan? Not solved, but a new clue in the patchwork of evidence submitted for review to Nature, but available as a preprint. If you're interested, I explored other clues on a recent edition of Discovery on the BBC. You can find a link to that on our webpage at bbcworldservice.com. And I was talking there to Mark Elwar. In some ways... The quick success in finding effective vaccines against COVID-19 may have made coronavirus science seem easy. But another aspect of the pharmaceutical battle shows otherwise. Thanks to earlier research, some promising candidate antivirals that might be effective against SARS-CoV-2 were available. The best known is remdesivir, which has to be delivered intravenously and so in a hospital setting at which point it seems the disease has generally progressed too far for the treatment to be much help. Nevertheless, the pricey antiviral was approved. A related compound, molnupiravir, named after Thor's hammer, was also in development before the pandemic and was quickly taken up by the pharmaceutical giant MSD, also known as Merck. Again, inpatient trials have been disappointing, but they are also trialling it for outpatients and to prevent infection in the first place. And they can do this, study leader Daria Hazuda told me, because molnupiravir can be taken as a tablet. Yes, that is an advantage of molnupiravir, using the drug in outpatients rather than having to 
a hookup and IV line. The, the drug is orally available. And so that's a potential significant advantage. And that is particularly important with these kinds of viruses. So respiratory viruses generally, flu, RSV, and, uh, and coronavirus, the, the earlier you're able to intervene, the more significant the clinical benefit is. You want to stop the virus before it takes hold. Well, certainly before it takes hold, that would be, that's ideal. And that's a situation we call a PrEP or, or prevention. And we are studying that. But even after someone is infected, the host actually mounts, for all of these viruses, mounts a, a really dramatic immune and inflammatory response. And so it sort of, it sort of lights a fire. And even when the virus stops replicating, you know, that fire continues to burn. And, and in a lot of cases, that's what lands people in the hospital. And so you, you want to prevent the virus from igniting that fire. That is what really ends up causing the hu- a huge amount of damage to the patient. And am I right that you've, you've tried this both for inpatients and for outpatients so far? Yes, we did two small studies looking at both inpatients and outpatients, and and we saw that exact phenomena, that the greatest benefit is in the outpatient setting before that fire gets ignited. Um, And so that's why our phase three studies are really focused on the outpatient setting. And you're also now about to start using this as a prevention method. Yes, to me, that's equally exciting. We know antivirals work incredibly effectively in preventing infection. This has been demonstrated in influenza. Influenza drugs work remarkably well when they're given to you know, healthy people to prevent acquisition of, of influenza and also HIV. And certainly under circumstances where vaccines are unlikely to work or take too long to work, using an antiviral is an incredibly effective way of preventing people from becoming infected. So what's this trial going to look like? It's in a family setting, identifying someone who has a confirmed positive coronavirus diagnosis and giving it to other members of the, of the household. And you'll be comparing families where they are taking the molnupiravir with families where they're not and just seeing if there's a lower infection rate? Yes, absolutely. What about the price of this? Remdesivir was famously expensive uh, when it was first being marketed, at least in the USA. What's the price of uh, molnupiravir going to be? Because there's a lot of people listening to this who can't afford those prices. That's a really important point. So molnupiravir is a small molecule. The route of synthesis is fairly straightforward. So, you know, we're, we're fairly confident that we can price it at a point that will make it accessible. Because that's obviously going to be the interesting thing. There are parts of the world where vaccines are only getting in at 2% levels at the moment. And, you know, if there's a different route, such as these antivirals for protecting some at-risk people, that's clearly going to be an interesting prospect. I think it will have a, an important role to play should the studies prove successful. I think it will have a, a, a very important role to play in, in those kinds of populations for, for sure, especially when we're, we're talking about, you know, high risk situations like institutions, elder care facilities, uh, where, you know, we know that once the virus gets in, it spreads very quickly. And so the idea would be if you had an infection in a setting like that, or for example, doctors or health workers potentially exposed, this is the kind of situation where you'd want to be able to use an antiviral like this, a prophylactic antiviral. Yes, absolutely. And the other advantage, as we're seeing with vaccines, it's still an open question whether or not some of the new variants that are appearing, if the vaccines are retaining equivalent efficacy. And so when you look at whether or not antivirals are impacted by those uh, mutations which can impact vaccine efficacy, they're not. So molnupiravir retains really robust activity across all of the variants that we've looked at so far, which is the other advantage. Daria Hazuda, and while those trials go on, accelerating vaccination seems particularly important. Meanwhile, other science goes on. One of the problems with Alzheimer's and other forms of dementia is that by the time the symptoms of those are clear, too much damage has been done to the brain for treatment to help much. The drug was recently approved in the US, but experts quibble about the good it does. At Bath University, Researchers, led by George Stothart, have developed a sensitive technique for spotting changes in the brain's electrical activity that could signal the early stages of incipient dementia. I went to try it on. Right, so this is the EEG system that I'm going to place on your head. This is basically a swimming cap. Yeah, it's near (laughs) Oh, God, I've just pulled something off. 
That's okay. It's the same material they make wetsuits out of. Right, so okay, so that's wrapped around. All the material is really doing is just holding things in place. The, the bits that are doing all the work are the electrodes. So I've got these wires yeah. up here on my head. And then, yeah. okay, this is an electrode that I'm touching here on the yeah, left side of my skull. So that's just a metal contact point. And I'm right. going to clip something on your ear now. That's just a little reference <laughs> electrode. So that's a ground and a reference, an electrical ground for the other electrodes. I wasn't going to win any fashion prizes with a crocodile clip snapped to my earlobe or the electronically instrumented swimming cap, but that wasn't the aim. That was to read my brain activity as I saw a series of pictures on a computer screen. Put my glasses on. OK, the first thing you're going to do is a little pre-task and it's going to involve naming eight images out loud and they're making a short discrimination task between them. So it should all be fairly self-explanatory. And it's all explained here on the screen. So I'll press the space bar to start. There we go. Okay, calculator. I have to say that, do I? You have to say it out loud. And by saying it out loud, that's activating a lot of Which image did you just see? Oh, I see what you... Yes, okay. I've now seen on the screen a calculator and a nest. Mm -hmm. And it's saying, which one did I actually see? So I say the calculator. Whoops, because I hit the wrong button. Yeah. (laughs) We're scoring They're badly tiny already. arrow keys on these laptops. So in normally we use a, a keyboard with nice big keys. So now we have a, a fish, a guppy, I think that is. Mm-hmm. Not that I'm a zoologist. And again, it's asking me which did I just see? And there's a toothbrush, electric toothbrush, and the guppy. So I hit left again. That says I'm correct. A candle. And so my memory continued getting loaded with simple images until I was ready to start the dementia test. So this is the bit where we record the EEG and where we get the really useful data from your brain activity. So you're going to see these images now flash up very rapidly and embedded in this stream are going to be the images that you just learned. And this time I don't have to do anything. You don't have to do anything. I just have to sit there and watch. Yeah. Okay, a bit like TV. Yeah. Off we go. They are very fast. Yeah. And are you able to spot the ones that you've seen before? I, it, it, it's interesting. It's, I feel slightly challenged. But yes, I, I think I'm recognising everything that I've yeah. seen before. I mean, I, I find it astonishing because obviously there's no big effort going on in my no. brain as I look at these things. But no. you can actually tell the difference between when I, you know, a helicopter there I hadn't seen before. Yeah. But your machine could tell me exactly. that's different. It's incredible how much your brain does automatically, unconsciously, and in this case, with hardly any time at all. So there's only 333 milliseconds between each image. But that's enough for your brain to do an enormous amount of processing and also register the fact that it's seen the image before. And the part of your brain that recognises the repeated images that you've seen before, that's the part of the brain that is hit by Alzheimer's pathology very early on in the disease process. Of course, memory tasks are a key part of standard dementia tests, as was made famous only recently. It's like you'll go person, woman, man, camera, TV. So they say, could you repeat that? So I said, yeah. So it's person, woman, man, camera, TV. That was called the Montreal Cognitive Assessment. Uh, It's a tool designed to pick up neurological impairment. So that's the standard way in which we pick up functional deficits at the moment. But they're insensitive to the early stages of Alzheimer's disease. And that's partly because you're looking at, for example, the strength of the signal, the speed of the signal, and you're not requiring me to actually vocalise. Exactly. we, We get a graded response. So it's not a binary thing anymore. It's not, yes, I remember it, or no, I don't. And it's implicit unconscious, so it doesn't matter if your participant perhaps hasn't understood you when you gave them the instructions, or um, if they're a bit confused or stressed or disorientated because they're in a laboratory doing a task. We can bypass that, and we're getting at the unconscious automatic processes. Team member Sophie Aldman has seen the difference this passive approach to measurement makes for patients outside the clinic. Yes, I've been doing it with patients who have mild cognitive impairment. So uh, that's the very, very early stages. So from there, some people can develop Alzheimer's or dementia and some people don't. Because I guess that's where anxiety might be more of an issue. And If this system is simple, that could be a help. Yes, definitely. As George was saying, things such as the ACE or the MOCA, they can be very, very intimidating. Um, The questions, people feel as though they should do well, but when they don't, they panic. 
and it's instant anxiety, so they instantly feel as though they're not doing very well. With this, they don't really know exactly what's going on in the sense of it's very, very simple. They know they can do it. And people who've been very, very relaxed, because obviously I'm in their home, so it's a much more relaxed procedure than them coming into a lab. Back in his office, George Stothart was ready to show me what the electrical recordings look like. Not mine. I wanted to avoid those. So, yeah, so what we're looking at now is an EEG trace. So we're looking at wavy lines, uh, which reflect voltage changes over time. And so there's a line for each channel, the, each electrode that we recorded from. And it was a merry mess with no obvious pattern to be seen. The trick of George's algorithm is to pick out only the activity that's synchronised with the three and a second changes in the pictures I've been shown. The brain mirrors the input. So if you stimulate at three hertz, the brain will give you a response back at three hertz. And so we embed different frequencies of stimulation in our image stream. And those are tied to particular cognitive functions. And are you saying that a healthy brain will sort of show a stronger response, as it were, at, yeah. that, at that frequency? Exactly. So the images that you learned in the pre-task, where you saw the different images and you had to name them out loud, they actually only occurred every five images. And so the frequency of those images appearing is 0.6 hertz. If we see power activity in that frequency range we know the brain was doing something to that image. And so what we see in reality is that healthy brains show a 0.6 hertz increase. Okay. Alzheimer's patients do not, or it's significantly reduced. It is very exciting. I mean, I can't emphasise enough, this is entirely novel, a novel way of an early diagnosis for dementia. And that is what is so important. Bridget Lum is a professor of neuroscience at Bristol University, but also chairs the science committee for the small dementia charity Brace, which saw potential in George Stothar's proposed method and decided to support its development. I mean, it's estimated that many dementias aren't diagnosed as such for the first 20 years. And of course, the earlier you can detect somebody's vulnerability to dementia, then you can start to make interventions and lifestyle changes, which will slow the onset of dementia. And I suppose the analogy here is in the early detection of diabetes, uh, where lifestyle changes can make a real difference. So things like exercise, cutting down on smoking or stopping smoking, and moderating alcohol. And they just slow down the progression of the disease? Yes, that is what the evidence would suggest. Yeah, what's good for your heart is good for your brain. And so stopping smoking, improving your diet, increasing exercise, those sorts of things can help keep your head above water for longer with something like dementia. And also there is the public appetite for this early diagnosis. So Alzheimer's Research UK survey people last year, they asked, would you want to know if you had Alzheimer's disease, even if you didn't have any symptoms? And 75% of people said, yes, they do want to know. And I think that's because it can help them plan. It can help them manage their family and their expectations and their affairs. Um, and it can make a material impact on, on how they live the rest of their life. Thanks to George Stothart and his team. And now an early release scheme proposed for earthquakes. The well-known earthquake zones, California, for example, occur where tectonic stresses accumulate at a fault until it ruptures. But the way we extract natural gas, drill oil or even get geothermal energy can disturb unknown faults away from plate boundaries and trigger so-called induced earthquakes. We've talked about swarms of these in the oil fields of Oklahoma and about induced quakes in a geothermal trial at Pohang in South Korea. Geoengineer Derek Ellsworth told me about those and about how smarter approaches could reduce the earthquake size. You drill down four kilometres um, into very low permeability rock. Uh, you have to create permeability by essentially either hydraulic fracturing or hydraulically shearing the pre-existing fractures just by applying a, a slightly lower pressure than you'd need to fracture them. And then you drill a second hole to be able to recover the fluid so that you basically set up a geological heat exchanger, pump in cold water, have it traverse across the stimulated reservoir, pick up heat and then recover it to the surface and then repeat in kind of a closed loop uh, circulation. 
and the trouble in that case was it, it was disturbing, as it were, the, rock, the rock tectonics or the rock mechanics there. Yeah, there had been historic earthquakes in the region, not for many, many years, and uh, it was presumably close to failure, primed, and the, uh, the extra change in the fluid pressure reduced the strength of the existing fault enough that it was able to slip. So it always seems to me that in an earthquake, the tectonics is a bit like straws on a camel's back. They build up until the yep. camel's back breaks. Yes. Or, in this case, you slightly weaken the back, the camel's back. Yes, it can occur in two ways. So by injection, it's by weakening the camel's back. If it's by withdrawal, so if, for instance, the, uh, the Groningen uh, gas field in uh, the Netherlands, which is due to be shut down because of earthquake activity, uh, it's recovery of fluids. And in that case, the stresses are changed and the stress, strength remains constant, but the stresses rise by deformation within the, the reservoir. So it can happen in and both And then ways. you just push it beyond the yeah. limit. Yes. And the size of an earthquake, once a fault starts to move, then the size that you actually end up with, as far as I can tell, is a bit pot luck. And that's the bit that you're now looking at in this research. The size is quite closely related to the area of the fault that slips. And so if the rupture propagates a very large uh, area, it'll give a potentially larger event. And so you can control that size by potentially cycling the fluid, it seems, uh, as the the work that we've done has, has shown. If I'm right, what you've done so far is to try this in a lab with some expensive rock, am I right? This is This is been tried on a small scale yeah it's the laboratory experiments that are the ones in the the paper but uh, it has been attempted at field scale there was a a field demonstration project in finland where it was done in a borehole in an underground research lab as part of the finnish uh, nuclear waste disposal program and actually interestingly enough it was also this cycled injection was also attempted at pohang and clearly the the results at pohang didn't uh, uh, echo the, the positive results of, of this outcome that you'd expect. So are there particular lessons then from the controlled circumstances you can engineer in a lab? I think the main lessons is that it matters a lot how close to failure you might be when you start injecting fluid pressures. So if tectonically the fault is stressed up close to failing and that you apply only the small volume of fluid or that is necessary to be able to push it over the top, then you can potentially reap the full tectonic uh, stresses that are applied on the fault and you end up with a much bigger event than the volume of fluids that you've injected would uh, suggest. And I mean it sort of sounds academic but as I understand it uh, for people for example who live in Oklahoma these swarms of earthquakes that they've experienced are uh, very distressing. Yeah they're damaging Uh, so certain parts of the, the U.S. Uh, are expecting earthquakes, uh, California on the worst west coast, for instance, and so building codes take account of uh, that expectation of that you'll have some seismicity. But those codes don't exist for places in the Midwest, such as Oklahoma. So the size of the, th- the events are quite large. They've been upper five magnitude events, and they've toppled uh, chimneys and done damage to buildings. And so, yeah, they are quite distressing. How much of a difference do you think you can make by, shall we say, tickling the fault rather than uh, fully pumping on it the way they do now? Well, you can potentially control the the rates at which you inject. Of course, you want to inject a certain volume, so pumping at high rates is desirable. But if you control rates uh, by reducing it, then you'll build up the pressures less and potentially you can keep yyourself from tipping the fault over that critical reduction in strength that will spawn an earthquake. So by controlling rates, by reducing them, it seems that also by oscillating the the pumping, changing the pressures over time, you can also change the magnitudes of the events that you get by driving smaller events that are more frequent, but are therefore less distressing and less damaging as a result. What about the well-known earthquake fault zones? I mean, (laughs) you've, you've probably been asked this so many times, but it would be absolutely brilliant if all the tectonic energy that you have in those things could be released gently in lots of little earthquakes than one big one. In terms of the physics, does that all sort of fit in with the kinds of things that you're talking about? And if if it's a bad idea, why? You could control them, and it has been discussed as you should try and could try and control them. But the problem of getting it wrong uh, has huge implications for liability. So... The famous uh, earthquake experiment in the 1960s in uh, the uh, Rocky Mountain Arsenal 
created an earthquake as a result of pumping up a fault then created damage as a result of that. And so trying to ge generate earthquakes uh, a priori has not been revisited primarily because of the, uh, the liability. Who's liable? Presumably the person who injects the fluid. I mean, it is sort of the equivalent, I guess, of burning the litter in yeah. forests to try and reduce forest fires. You're trying to get rid of some of the, some of the uh, ignition points in a way. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it, um, I, I don't know how on earth one... Maybe if you, what you do in Oklahoma would give people some confidence that there may be another place to try it somewhere a long way from anybody. I think you need someone willing to take the risk, and I don't think people are willing to take the risk and the liability that comes with that risk. I mean... From the events that are occurring in Oklahoma, presumably it is slowly de-stressing it tectonically, and therefore in the long term, even though you're getting earthquakes in the short term, you're reducing the likelihood and the magnitude of what will occur tectonically over a much longer time span. Of course, I did ask Derek whether you could try the same trick on the San Andreas fault. He asked me if I'd pay for the insurance in case it went wrong. No thanks. But his more modest proposal was just published in Geophysical Research Letters. We've also put a link to Derek's Penn State Uni webpage on our Science in Action webpage, which you'll find at bbcworldservice.com. With that, from me, Ronan Pease, and producer Anja Liktorovich, thanks for listening.